Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to be working through the Math 150 Practice 1 sheet that covers questions related to the basic definitions, sampling techniques, and categorical variables lecture videos. In uh, this, we're going to work through the sort of two questions on this practice sheet going through each component of them, sort of working through how to solve all of them. Uh, if you're just, again, interested in what those solutions are, you can always look in the additional practice folder for the solution document or look at the annotated document in the description of this video. In terms of going through these questions, let's go ahead, jump right in and get started. So on question one, we have this idea that we're working for a group called Animal Rights for All that advocates extra funding and care for animal shelters and animal charities. You want to know Californians' opinions about additional taxes that would be used to support animal rights and animal organizations. So what we do is we first divide California into three major regions, Northern California, Central California, and Southern California. We then randomly choose 1,000 people from each region, so 3,000 people overall, and mail them each a survey with the name of our organization, Animal Rights for All, and the following question. Considering that animals are living beings that deserve respect and care, how supportive are you of paying additional taxes that would be used exclusively for animal wellness? The choices that each person gets to have are very supportive, supportive, neutral, or not supportive. Notice that this makes this a categorical variable since each person is going to put themselves into one of the four categories. Notice also it is the type of categorical variable that we're focused on in this class where each individual gives a single response. We also have the information that of the 3,000 people we mail, only 200 respond. So even though we tried to get a hold of 3,000 people, only 200 of them actually responded. We get the following data. 28 people said that they were very supportive, 42 said supportive, 60 said neutral, and 70 said not supportive. So we've got a number of things that we'd like to be able to do with this. We've got our initial sort of pieces of diagnoses uh, that we'd like to do. What is the population of interest? What is the sample? What is the individual? Those are all sort of basic definitions. We'll talk about the sampling technique that was used to build this sample. We'll construct a relative frequency table for our data and use this to draw a bar graph. Those are all things that we should be comfortable with for categorical variables like this. And then we'll answer a question about the percentage of people surveyed that said they, they were ne either neutral or not supportive. So we'll try all that on the next page here. So we've got our text there in case we want to reference it above. So for A, we'd like to talk about the sample or the population. For B, we'd like to talk about the sample. And for C, we'd like to talk about the individual. Now, while these are all separate questions, uh, I always like to start with the sample. If you can figure out the sample, then usually it's easier than to determine the population in an individual. Well, remember that what we tried to do was talk to 3,000 people or 3,000 Californians, but we only got 200 to respond. Remember that a sample is all the individuals that you actually collect data about. So our sample would be 200 Californians. Well, then we can use that to understand the individual and population. The individual would be one Californian, and the population would be all Californians. Now, how do we know that we're focusing on Californians? Why do we, why were we saying that rather than 200 people, one person, all people? Well, it does say directly in here that you want to know Californians' opinions about additional taxes. Not any other states, not just people in the U.S. in general, not people across the world, just specifically Californians. So we are putting that detail into this. Notice we're not saying anything about their opinion about uh, animal funding or anything like that because the variable is not part of this. It's just who we were studying, which was all Californians. We made use of the 200 Californians to try to understand all Californians, and the building block of that was one Californian. What sampling technique was used here? So we want to get our sort of technique. Well, it says here that what we did is we randomly chose a uh, thousand people from each region. So the fact that it's telling us that we did this randomly rules out like a convenience uh, sample. Since we took some time at the beginning to divide California into three major regions and then take a sample from each region and put all that together, the technique here would be stratified. Remember, stratified comes with that initial classification. The strata here would be each region. 
So, in other words, the three strata were Northern California, Central California, and Southern California. We wanted to make sure that some people from each region of California were represented. Okay, let's go ahead and build our relative frequency table. So, keep in mind to do that, we'll need to recreate this table, with, but with instead of frequencies, we'll want percentages. To do that, we'll need to do some division. So we'll have their response here. And just to make things easier, I'll just sort of go ahead and abbreviate. We'll put very supportive, supportive, neutral, and not supportive. And then we'll want their sort of percentage. So what are we gonna be dividing by here? Well, you gotta make sure you divide by your sample size. Don't trick yourself and think that you divide by 3,000. 3,000 is sort of an irrelevant piece of information here. We wanna divide everything by 200 because our sample size was actually 200. So 28 divided by 200 would give us 0.14 as a percentage that is 14%. Next one would be 42 divided by 200, which would give us 0.21, which is 21%. Then 60 divided by 200, which would give us 0.3, which is 30%. And then 70 divided by 200 would give us 0.35, which is 35%. If you want to check, you can sum up these percentages and they will sum up to 100% because everybody had to give one of these four responses. All right, let's use this to build a bar graph based on these relative frequencies. So we'll do a relative frequency bar graph. Remember, a relative frequency bar graph just means a bar graph, but we're going to use the percentages to understand that sort of vertical axis or to draw that vertical axis. So there we go. So we'll put over here that this is the relative frequency in percentage. We know that this is going to have to be 0% at the bottom, and then we'll need some consistent scale. Since we have things like uh, all the way up to 35%, we could go by 5 or 10%. So maybe we can do 10% there, 20%, 30%. And our last mark will be 40%. That should be pretty easy to locate everything. I'll use the same abbreviations for their responses. So there's very supportive, supportive, neutral, and not supportive. And we can put as our label here, level of support. So for very supportive, we would need to draw to 14%, which should be a little under halfway between 10 and 20%. For supportive, we should draw to 21, which is just barely over 20% there. For neutral, we should draw all the way up to 30% there. And for not supportive, we need to draw to 35%, which is right there, directly in half between 30 and 40%. Again, we can go ahead and put our percentages. That was 14, 21, 30, and 35% there. All right, so there we go. There's a relative frequency bar graph to help us sort of visualize these percentages here. Last thing we wanted to do is we wanted the percent of sample who were neutral or not supportive. So again, remember that that word or generally mathematically indicates an addition or you know, sort of combining things. Uh, so we know that we had 30% of people were neutral, 35% were not supportive. We can just add those. 30% plus 35% is 65%. So in other words, 65% of our sample were neutral or not supportive. Put another way from maybe a more practical standpoint, this meant that about 65% of the people we talked to would require some sort of additional convincing or motivation to actually support our policy, which was uh, trying to have additional taxes to support animal charities and animal welfare. So right now, if this was you know trying to push some sort of legislation, it wouldn't look like there's a good amount of support because 65% of people either are sort of okay about it and not really for it or against it and or non-supportive so definitely not carrying a majority of support right now there'd be some work to do to convince those people all right so this was sort of a quick recap of some of the major things about categorical variables as well as the basic terminology of population sample and individual making sure you understand the technique that was used here as well as some of the things that we do for descriptive statistics of categorical variables let's go ahead and take a look at the second question on this practice as well 
So we're going to suppose that there is a pizza delivery company that is trying to study the most popular type of pizza from their specialty menu. So maybe they have some normal pizzas, but they also have this specialty menu. So to do this, they take every seventh order from their specialty menu and record what type of pizza was ordered until they have collected data on 160 orders. Then the company constructs the following table for their data. So they've got these four specialty pizzas, sweet potato and corn, honey and goat cheese, green chili and sausage, spinach and potato. And this is the percentage of the orders for each one of those. Now, if you think about this, this would be what we are calling a relative frequency table, right? Because it tells us each of the four categories and the percentage of the individuals, or in this case, of the orders that landed in each of those categories. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at some of this stuff. We want to look at the population, sample, and individual, talk about the sampling technique, take this and change it into an actual frequency table, as well as construct a pie chart for this data. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and, yep, we've got it on the next page here, so we can go ahead and do it here. Uh, so for A, the, we want the population, B, the sample, and C, the individual. Now, this one, I think, is, again, really benefits from finding the sample first. If we go back here, we can see what did we actually collect data on. We collected data on 160 orders. So our sample here would be 160 orders. What does that make an individual then? Well, just one order. And what is that population? Well, all orders from specialty menu, right? They did say specifically that they're only focused on the orders from their specialty menu. So when we specify the population, we should include that. And notice that this one is not where the individuals are people. Instead, each individual in this situation is a single order from the specialty menu. Okay, perfect. Let's talk about the technique that was used here. Well, if we go back and think about how they collected this, they said that they took every seventh order. Now you'll notice that there's no mention of the word random in here. So you can rule out things like an SRS stratified in cluster. All those will have the word random actually in the description of the survey. This time though, we have this system every seventh order that is a mathematical system so this would be a systematic sample here so the technique was systematic what was the actual system every seventh order so again systematic remember this actually counts as random even though it doesn't say random in the text and it counts as random because that mathematical system basically, if you follow it rigidly, will act the same as choosing the orders randomly. So this would be an example of a systematic sample. All right, let's go ahead and look at part E, where we'll start doing some computation. We want to construct an actual frequency table. That means we're going to need to do some multiplications. So we'll have the sort of, uh, I guess we can say the type here. So I guess we can do some abbreviations. We'll call this one like SPC, sweet potato and corn, uh, honey, goat cheese, uh, green chili sausage, and spinach potato. Uh, and we want the actual frequency. So in other words, we're saying how many of the 160 orders were of each type. So remember that means we're going to be doing some multiplications. So for this first one here, I'll go ahead and just write it off uh, to the side what we're actually going to do, and then we'll do the other ones sort of more quickly. We'll take this 30%, write it as a decimal, so that's 0 0.30, times the amount of orders, which is 160. And if we do that calculation on our calculator, 0 0.30 times 160, you should get 48. That means that 48 of those actual 160 orders were sweet potato corn pizza. So 48 out of 160 gives us 30%. For the others, we'll do the same computations, but I'll just go ahead and directly do them on the calculator. So for 26.3%, you have 0.263 times 160. That is 42.08, needs to be a whole number, so we would round it to 42. For the green chili sausage, we take the decimal as 0.369 times 160. We should get 59.04, the nearest whole number is 59. Finally, for the spinach and potato, 6.9% is 0.069 times 160, and you should get 
as a whole number, that would be 11. If you want to do a quick check, we can add these frequencies, 48 plus 42 plus 59 plus 11. Those really do sum up to the 160 orders that they actually studied. So this would be an actual frequency table. During the course of their study, they sold or had at least ordered 48 sweet potato and corn pizzas, 42 honey goat cheese pizzas, 59 uh, green chili sausage pizzas, and 11 spinach and potato pizzas. All right. Let's go ahead and finish this up with a pie chart. Remember, a pie chart is the other visual display for categorical data. Uh, remember that the reason we want both of them is that bar graphs are very, very good for comparing one category's popularity against another. Uh, a pie chart is really good for comparing one category's popularity against the whole survey or study. Remember that when building a pie chart, you want to always make use of the relative frequency. So we'll make use of these since they'll help us understand how much of the circle each piece should actually sort of represent. So we'll draw ourselves a nice circle there give ourselves a middle. Again, we're just trying to do this as best we can. Probably the closest one to something that's easy to draw is the honey and goat cheese, which should be just a little bit over a quarter. So if I was going to draw a quarter, it would probably look something like that. So we'll angle ours down just a little bit. So that'll be slightly over a quarter. There we go. So that will be the honey goat cheese. Now, of course, with that one done, I can draw something almost the same for sweet potato and corn, but just a little bit bigger. So if you imagine sort of drawing the same sort of piece over here, but you make it just a little bit bigger, and that will take care of the uh, sweet uh, potato and corn one. So let's go ahead and do that just a little bit larger. So that will be our sweet potato corn one. Okay. And then finally, the green chili sausage should again sort of be almost the same as sort of this. So if we imagine sort of drawing uh, this guy like that, right? we want to draw it a little bit uh, larger than that. So if we go ahead and we do that, looks like that should be probably right about there. Yep. And we'll call that the green chili sausage piece. Okay, notice it makes sense. This piece, a right? little bit larger, this piece, a little bit larger, this piece, and then this small one here, that's uh, your spinach and uh, potato pizza. So there we go. There's our pie chart. And again, what's the sort of point of a pie chart? Well, it's to really help us understand how much of the overall, in this case, sort of sales or orders were dominated by a single category. And again, really the point of that is that a lot of times when we hear a number, uh, I'll go ahead and put check marks on all those, like 36.9%, you might say, ah, it doesn't sound like a huge percentage, you know, 36.9%. But then when you see that sort of visually and you see this entire chunk just taken up by that one type of order, you really recognize, oh, wow, that is making up a lot of our sort of sales, especially when we have sort of three other ones. And this is by far taking up the sort of biggest chunk of the overall circle. So there we go. This ran you guys through a couple uh, sort of uh, examples of working with categorical variables, but as well as doing some of the sort of basic diagnostics of population sample individual as well as sampling technique.